Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and this is the first video in a set of videos I'm going to do that explain how you validate a boundary resolution. I think it might be a three video set, maybe four. So in this first video, we're just going to kind of introduce this topic, explain what we mean here with this question, and then I'm going to give you the first three steps um, to, to, to validate a boundary resolution. Then in the next video, we're going to work through an, an example of how you might do that. Uh, then after that, we're going to talk about um, a little bit, we're going to go a little more in depth on step three. And then I think in the in the fourth and final video in the set, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how you can document some of this work you do to validate a boundary resolution in your survey report or on your survey map or both. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this question and, and, and define some terms here. How do you validate a boundary resolution? So when we say boundary resolution, what do we mean? So a boundary resolution is uh, the result of a of the boundary survey process. So uh, when a surveyor goes and he does uh, records research and record review, and then he goes out and he does, uh, he or she goes out and does a field survey, and then she evaluates evidence, and then she comes back in the office and she does uh, calculations and analysis and more evaluation of evidence, and then the surveyor, maybe he um, uh, takes all that measurement data and the evidence and uh, he creates some geometry. We typically would do that in a, in a, in a drawing program like AutoCAD or BricsCAD. You come up with some geometry that represents the parcel. That geometry that you come up with, not just the shape and the size, but also the location on the surface of the earth, that is a boundary resolution. That's what I mean when I ask this question. So you, you as a land surveyor have gone through a process and you have come up with some geospatial data representing the shape, size, and location of a parcel on the surface of the earth. So in this question, how do you validate a boundary resolution? What do we mean by validate? Is that like when you get your parking, you know, your parking ticket stamped um, when you're downtown at the movies? Uh, kind of. It's a different kind of validate. Okay, what we mean, what we mean by validate is you're trying to check it. You're trying to check your boundary resolution. You want to know, when you check your boundary resolution, do you find evidence that you've made a mistake or a blunder, or are there alternative solutions to the resolution of the boundary that you need to consider? And what, what a lot of, of common people or lay people, people that aren't surveyors, what they don't realize is there's a, a, often not a black and white answer to where the location of a parcel boundary is. Uh, so there can be more than, there can be alternate, alternate solutions um, in fact, that's even encoded into state law. When a surveyor finds alternate solutions, um, he has to he has to disclose that on a map. So you want to know: did, did you choose the best of the available alternate solutions? If there was one one more than one solution for the for the location of the boundary, so that's what we mean by validate. You, you know, it, resolving a boundary is a serious thing. It, it impacts a lot of people's property rights. It can it can um, you know lead to a lot of liability. And, and harm if it's not done properly. So, you know, whenever you can, as a land surveyor, you want to get some confirmation that you've come up with a good resolution. So we're going to talk in this video about the three things you can do as a boundary surveyor to validate your boundary resolution. So this is the work that you're going to do after you've already come up with what you feel is a reasonable solution to the location of the boundary. You want, you want to go through these three steps. Okay. And, uh, you can't always do all three of these steps. In fact, in some rare cases, you can't do any of them. But what I want to tell you at this point is whenever you can, you want to do all three. So you don't want to skip any of these. And a lot of surveyors get into trouble because they only do the first one on this list and they don't do the second two. And that, that's bad. You don't want to do that. You want to do all three. Okay, now as we go through these three, I will stop for each one and explain in what circumstance and circumstance or or circumstances might you not be able to run the check that we're talking about. Okay, so here's the first check you should do. You should compare the record data to the measured or calculated data for the subject parcel itself. So you've come up with some data. It's either measured or calculated. You've come up with some data for your boundary resolution. So for every line of your subject parcel, You've either got a measured value between two monuments or you've got a value that you've calculated 
th through some method, right? And you want to compare that to the record data for your subject parcel. Now, this could be right here. When I say record data, that means a historical measurement, right? A historical angle or, or historical distance or area. Okay, this record data right here is, is going to be in your deed. Okay, it could be in your deed or it could be on a survey map of your subject parcel, either the controlling subdivision map that created your parcel or a retracement survey. So you want to compare the record data for your deed, first and foremost, primarily, and then secondary, and then secondly, um, any any survey map of your subject parcel. So you're just you're going around the boundaries of your subject parcel, and you're comparing what is, what is what do historical survey measurements say about the shape and and size of this parcel, and what do my measurements say about it or my calculations, right? So you're just comparing your survey for the subject parcel to other surveys or historical measurement data for your subject parcel. So that's the first check. Now I mentioned before, in a lot of circumstances, that's the only check surveyors do. So they don't even go, they don't even do these two. All they do is look at their subject parcel, okay? Which, which can cause problems. Okay, now in what circumstance might you not be able to run this check? If you've got a parcel that doesn't have measurements in the deed, in the land description of the deed, and there is no survey map of your parcel, then you then you won't be able to run this check. Now that actually happens a lot more than, than you might think if you're not a surveyor. So it's actually very typical. Okay, so I'll give you a quick example. If you're if you buy a parcel and your deed says that you you own the south half of the southeast quarter of the southwest southwest quarter of section 23 and it's never been surveyed which is fairly typical for some rural property where i practice here in central california if that's what your deed says and there's no survey you don't have anything to check your measurements against okay in step one there is no record data to check against because the land description in your deed doesn't contain actual measurement data it's not meets and bounds and there is no um, there is no no previous survey okay but if, if there are deed measurements or there's a map that, that either created or retraced your subject parcel, then you want to you wanna compare that to what you measure or calculated. Okay, so that's step one. Okay, let's go to step two. Now remember, step two and step three are often skipped by half-baked um, fly-by-night surveyors that think they know how to do boundary surveying. Okay, so step two is you want to repeat, it's very similar to step one, except you're gonna, you're gonna repeat that process. You're gonna compare record data to your measured or calculated data, but you're gonna do this for the adjoining parcels. So when I say adjoining parcels, I mean one of two things, either the parcels that touch yours, that are immediately next door, or parcels that are in what we call the resolved boundary matrix. So they don't have to touch your parcel, but they're related to it in an important way. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about that in, in uh, the next video when we do the example. Okay, but you want to repeat this process for the adjoining parcels. Same thing. You want to look at, all right, what are my measurements and how does that compare to the measurements in either the deeds or the maps for the parcels next door, the adjoining parcels, right? And that could include things like street right away, road right away, canal right away, you know, funky stuff like that. Okay, those are still adjoining parcels. All right, the third check that you want to run is you want to compare, oh, let's talk about when you can't do this. Okay, so when can you not do step two? Okay, so it's very similar to step one. If you're dealing with an adjoining parcel that doesn't have record measurements in the land description of the deed or a controlling or creating survey map, then you're not gonna have anything to compare it to. So if you go back to that example I gave you before, if we are the north half, of the southeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 23 and the parcel south of us is the south half of the southeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 23 we're not going to be able to do a comparison there because neither one of the deeds have actual measurements angles bearings or distances and if neither one of them are on a survey map then we're not going to be able to run this second check all right so the third check that you can run <clears throat> and that you want to run if you can is you want to compare your calculated or measured data to physical occupation, the location of physical occupation. What do I mean when I say physical occupation? I mean walls, fences, hedges, sidewalks, buildings, 
right? Things that people have physically built on the parcel and you wanna say, how does my resolution fit with that physical occupation? Okay, so in order to do that, what does that mean? What does that require you to do in your field survey if you wanna run this third check? You have, to, you have to physically locate some, some occupation or you're not gonna be able to run this check. Again, this is a step that many surveyors skip. I remember a survey I did in, in, uh, up in, in the Sacramento area of California where a surveyor uh, proportioned like three or four miles. He did a, a public land survey system proportion and threw a bunch of, a bunch of fences off for, for, you know, three or four miles, he threw all the fences off. So he, he didn't check his boundary resolution against physical occupation. He caused a lot of problems, caused, caused a lot of problems. So you want to do this, right? And the reason you want to do this is in, in a lot of cases, physical occupation is good evidence of where the original boundary was at that you're trying to, to resolve or retrace. Now, we're going to do a, a, a separate video where I go into in a little more detail here on step three and show you, you know, how would this work? We'll look at some examples and then we'll also talk about, um, you know, when can you reasonably expect that some improvements might fit your, fit your survey and, and what are some situations in which it might not be reasonable to expect that? Okay, because you, you can have situations where the occupation doesn't fit your boundary resolution, but that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your boundary resolution. There's other reasons for that. So I, I want to teach you guys about that. Okay, but we'll do that in another video. So last thing for this video, when can you, when might you not be able to run this third check? Okay, if you have a parcel where there is no occupation, you won't be able to run this check. Now that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. So in, in, especially in rural areas, we might have vacant land. You know, it's, it's not being active farm, there's no fences, there's no walls, there's no buildings. You know, this can be tough. If you're out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, you know, there might not be any occupation. Okay, the other situation where you might not be able to run this third check is because of a, just a lack of monumentation, you've had to rely on physical occupation to actually come up with your boundary resolution. So you've split curbs or other improvements to, for example, come up with a block boundary and then you're using that for your boundary resolution, it's not gonna be a good check because it's not an independent check, right? Um, and now, what, what you could do in that situation is you look for other kinds of occupation that might validate your boundary resolution. So for example, if you split curbs to come up with a block boundary to figure out where your boundaries of your lot and the block are, you could use fences as a check, right? That's an, that would be a, an independent check with a different kind of occupation. So sometimes you can do that. All right, so there you go, guys. There's an introduction to this topic about how you validate a boundary resolution. We talked about what that actually means, and then I gave you the three steps. We're going to do uh, two or three more videos that walk you through these uh, processes, through this process in a little more detail. The very next video we're going to do, uh, we're going to look at an example. Maybe we'll do two examples where we actually show you what these, what, are the, what does this actually mean when you work through these three steps and, um, and we'll show you that with a couple of, of, of more concrete examples. So I know this is a, it's a complicated topic. It can make your head hurt, but it's really important. Thank you for watching.